Hello, I'm Bob Shoemaker. I'm Tim Hitchcock, and we're here at the London Metropolitan Archives to introduce our book, London Lives, Poverty, Crime, and the Making of a Modern City. This book is about how paupers and criminals force the pace of change and the evolution of the criminal justice system and the system of poor relief. It's about how the poor and the ne'er-do-well essentially created the modern systems of the adversarial trial and the welfare state. In the early 2000s, Tim and I digitized the, the records of the Old Bailey, London Central Criminal Court. But we wanted to know more about those individuals who ended up being tried at the Old Bailey. And to do that, we needed to digitize a far wider selection of records. The records kept here at the London Metropolitan Archives, records of poor relief, records of other criminal courts. And by digitizing those records and creating a website which we also called London Lies, which allowed us to trace these individual lies through a wide range of records, including poor relief records and other uh, criminal courts. And in fact, what we did is we dismembered the archives and we reconstructed them around the individuals who mattered to us. The parish and the parish community, its church, its vestry, its ratepayers, were the center of the system of social welfare in the 18th century. And paupers, the people at the bottom, mainly women, used that system, pushed that system to provide new forms of relief again and again through pauper letters, through showing up at the workhouse door pregnant and in labor, through the, all the pressures that a desperate person, an ill person, can put on a system. They did the equivalent of showing up at A&E and making sure that the 18th century social welfare system responded to their needs. People tend to think of the lives of the London poor in the 18th century as nasty, brutish, and short. And it certainly was insecure. More than half of the population could at one time or another fall into poverty through illness or injury or the loss of a job. This was a difficult time for anyone to survive. But equally, life was exciting. This was a town full of alehouses and coffee houses and pleasure gardens and fairs. There was a lot of joy and excitement to be had in living in the world's first modern city. We're here at the Old Bailey, which is a good place to talk about one of the main arguments of our book, which is that people who are accused of crime shape the development of judicial and penal policy in the 18th century. In terms of justice and the criminal trial, the main impact of defendants was to force the lawyerization of the criminal trial. Judges initially agreed to admit lawyers into the criminal trial, but it was the defendants who actually hired them and brought them in, paid them substantial amounts of money to defend themselves so that they could avoid the ultimate punishment, the death penalty. And they were remarkably, these counsel were remarkably successful at that, and they also forced the development of new laws of evidence, excluding, for example, accomplice evidence from the trials. In terms of penal policy, the state in the 18th century sought to develop new punishments to supplement the death penalty. But at every stage, it was those subject to those punishments who resisted those innovations and forced the state to think again. Whether it was hard labor in houses of correction or transportation across the seas or imprisonment here in London or on the hulks, in each case, those subject to those punishments resisted. They refused the hard labor, they mutinied, they escaped from prisons, and they returned from transportation. Ultimately, this forced the state to develop a new form of punishment, the penitentiary. This was not the result that accused criminals would have wished for, but they had forced that change to happen. This book is about people. People just like the thousands of mothers who were forced to leave their children to the care and uncertain futures provided by the Foundling Hospital behind us. But it's also about people like Thomas Limpus, who as a young man stole a handkerchief and was caught up with the criminal justice system, who ended up first in prison, later transported first to Africa and then back to London, again and again stealing and being caught, being forced to deal with the hulks, with the prisons, with the system of transportation until he was eventually transported to Australia in the first fleet. In the process, he changed the system of criminal justice. It's also about people like Harriet Russell, who as a parish orphan was brought up in parish care only to be um, deported, to be sent 
200 miles away to a factory apprenticeship in the early Industrial Revolution in Yorkshire, where she worked for seven years in impossible conditions. At the end of that, she came back to London and confronted the parish vestry, the vestrymen who had sent her on that journey, and in the process, forced them to take more care of the children who fell, followed in her footsteps. And it's also about people like Catherine Jones, a cripple living on the Welsh border in the 1760s, who wrote back over two decades in letter after letter to her parish of origin, to the parish of St. Dinah's Back Church, deep in the heart of the city, demanding money year on year to support her in her poverty, and doing so on the basis of a continual threat of coming back to London, of causing more expense by her presence than by her absence. In the process, she forced that parish to take new care, different care, of the paupers who were its responsibility. This book has taken us over 10 years to finish. And in the process, it surprised us with almost every turn. It surprised us in how we understand London. It surprised us in terms of how we thought the 18th century worked. It surprised us in what we thought that city was like. What surprised me, really, was that it is actually possible to turn the traditional story upside down, to write a history of social policy that's not a history of, uh, created by magistrates and lawmakers, but actually a history created by the poor and the criminal themselves. And I think the other thing that really surprised me, and hopefully our read will surprise our readers, is how much we actually can find out about the lives of these people at the very bottom of society. How they keep reappearing in the records for decades sometimes, doing significant things. For me, I was surprised by the extent to which this city simply worked. There was poverty and there was crime, there were disorderly neighborhoods and wealthy neighborhoods. But few people died on the streets. Few people mired, were entirely mired in unredeemable poverty. The parish was there, the criminal justice system was there, the systems of policing were there, all working in dialogue with a broader community to make this first modern city work.